I'm Dave Gledhill and uh, we, uh, I, I first flew this aeroplane when it was uh, on 56 Squadron at RAF Watersham in Suffolk. Um, but it seems to have followed me around the Air Force, although as you can see now from the, uh, the lack of a back end it's probably, uh, it, it's going to be hard for it to move from here. We, uh, Tony and I, um, first flew the aeroplane uh, when we were crewed together in Germany at RAF Wildenrath and uh, Tony was just arriving on the squadron just about the time that I uh, I was leaving so we, we were a crew together for a couple of months um, and then I came back to Coningsby as an instructor after that but uh, Tony here was uh, was one of the uh, it was his first tour on the airplane yeah, indeed so I'm still serving Wing Commander Tony Wheeler I've got a few more months to go before leaving the Air Force after 37 years but this aircraft certainly takes me back um, 1982 I joined 92 squadron as a young flying officer and Dave and I were crewed together for a short while whilst on the squadron uh, yes work hard and play hard was certainly the ethos in those days and in Germany the low-level air defense role um, was massive massively toast in uh, huge fun if we'd put into the authorization sheets for the mission anything other than really if we'd, we'd written in there go and have fun at low level with other NATO aircraft it probably would have been a good description of course we were constrained but uh, the flying was great fun. Uh, Dave and any of the other navigators in the back and the pilot up the front, we would make lots of noise at low level in Germany. Jet noise is the sound of freedom, it said on the squadron badges, 19 and 92. We made plenty of noise, um, but people knew why we were there. It was a fantastic time. Wildenrath at the time, of course, it was the height of the Cold War. Um, very different to the airfields in the UK that you see nowadays. Uh, uh, we operated from hardened aircraft shelters, spread around a, a, a loop taxiway in the dispersal um, and all the airplanes operated from that sort of posture all the time uh, we had one phantom in each hardened aircraft shelter um, we would walk out to the airplane and then go fly the sortie and then land back and go back into the hardened aircraft shelter for the turnaround uh, all the ground crew worked from in that environment so they went out to the hardened aircraft shelters to do the turnaround uh, to do the servicing um, very, very different to modern operations. We operated under threat of nuclear, chemical and biological attack. So uh, quite a lot of the time when an exercise was called, we'd be wearing gas masks, uh, which as you can imagine in a, in a Phantom cockpit was a little bit difficult. Uh, it's quite tight in there, uh, quite a yeah. constrained environment. And, uh, and, and sometimes uh, it, it, it added to the pressures of normal operations. Yeah, of course, at the height of the Cold War, we manned uh, what was referred to as quick reaction alert here in the UK but in Germany we called it battle flight and um, based upon the historical record of the lightning having kept a five minute readiness state based out of Goodislow when the F4 took over um, five minutes would have been set as the standard so we maintained five minute alert status um, day and night 24 hours and we were tested to it as well so you you'd sleep in the full gear G suits um, flying suit on the boots remaining on all night long uh, in two dedicated hardened aircraft shelters at the westerly end of the runway. Uh, no, the easterly end Eastly of the runway. End. Yeah. Ready for a westerly runway takeoff. And any time of the day or night, the, the hooter, the klaxon thing would go off. The has doors would automatically open, so they were kept well clear. And at the, the slight hint of that, you'd rush out to the cockpit, man up, up on the canopy, you'd have the helmets ready to go. Uh, it would be wired to the 20 volt DC just to keep the inertial nav warmed up ready to go and within five minutes you had to be airborne and um, we did test that I think three minutes 40 was a typical time for me from night time because on that's quite impressive uh, yeah <laughs> max eval and tack eval you would they'd blow the hooter at typically 2 33 in the morning and yeah three minutes 40 you could be airborne I, I recall that quite distinctly a few times skidding out onto the piano keys in wet on a wet runway condition uh, being slightly overzealous bringing up into afterburn as you come onto the runway um, yes lots of fond memories and uh, lots of things that you could potentially do wrong I remember once getting airborne without having turned the pitot heaters on climbing away in the winter over northern Germany and uh, all of a sudden you have zero airspeed on the clock luckily it's a quick simple remedy but um, not forgetting check was important. Germany was a lot different to UK in terms of the, the operations that we did. UK was very much a medium level operation although we were expecting a low level threat through the uh, through the airspace but in Germany it was all down low so uh, mm. we operated typically below 5,000 feet uh, quite often down as low as 250 feet and for war probably even lower than that. Yeah. A typical sortie would be we'd fly out at low level out into the combat air patrol area and then anything that came through the area was fair game. We would intercept it, we'd uh, uh, if somebody wanted to play they'd 
return and burn with us. If they didn't, they'd just waggle the wings and we'd leave them alone. But that was very much the norm. Uh, if the weather was bad at low level, which it often was, we'd probably still fly down there anyway. Yes. If the weather was really bad down at low level, we'd probably do a medium level sortie with one of the other agencies around the area. Maybe air combat, maybe intercepts, maybe supersonic intercepts, which we could do over land in fact. Um, so quite varied and, and, and unusual flying out there. Yeah, I mean, the typical missions, people often ask what was a typical mission at low level in Germany. Well, it was invariably a short one. and around about the one hour mark but dependent upon how many aircraft you'd encounter at low level would really set the mark there um, 25 minutes was my shortest sortie in i beat you on that one i did 19. all oh, right <laughs> so typically you get airborne as a pair go out to low level to the north northeast of um uh, of Wildenrath, coastfeld low flying area too um, anything you met you'd have would be fair game only if it was a civil aircraft would you haul off and not uh, pursue the attack but they were kept up above 1500 feet typically um, but you know once you got engaged with another aircraft you were using lots of afterburner at low level in the early 80s that was allowed discouraged but uh, if you didn't have afterburner, quite useful <laughs> if you didn't have afterburner in the F4 you wouldn't stay airborne for much longer and but if you did have a, lots of afterburner in it would lead to a short sortie they were quite exciting but a typical mission would be about, uh, about one hour long. This, uh, this aeroplane itself has quite an interesting history though. It, uh, it was one of the last aeroplanes in service when, uh, when the Phantom went out of service. And about 1992, uh, it was taken back to Wattisham where it was decommissioned, uh, sat in the Wattisham graveyard for a, for a short while before it was then taken down to a local scrapyard to be, to be scrapped. Uh, luckily, after the after end of uh, the aeroplane was cut off, uh, they, uh, the, the, the cockpit was saved and uh, a gentleman bought it and, and refurbished it. Uh, the current owner, Mike Davey, then uh, bought the aeroplane or bought the cockpit and uh, initially moved it over to Hack Green in, in the West Midlands uh, where it sat for a while before he brought it over here. The, the interesting thing about this aeroplane though is that the cockpit is almost uh, exactly as it was when we used to fly the aeroplane. It's been beautifully uh, preserved. Uh, all the instrumentation is in there. Uh, if you sit in there you can imagine yourself back flying the aeroplane. It, it is that complete. So a, a really good example of, of the beast. Sadly uh, with a little bit missing at the back. Indeed. <laughs> so it's great to sit back in it. I haven't sat in a, a fan of cockpit since the early 90s but um, it's amazing just how much comes back and Dave and I were discussing it earlier you can sit in there and almost close your eyes and put your hands on the controls um, that amount of familiarity was very typical with the aircraft the nice thing about the Phantom as well was it was analog it was old knobs and wheels and switches so when you climb in everything looks as it did in the day whereas with modern airplanes like the Tornado or the Typhoon for example it's all software driven so all the TV displays when you fire them up you can fly it one day a new software load is, is loaded up and then it's completely different the next day you fly. With this thing you climb in and it still looks like it did back in the 80s. Yeah, well, unfortunately it didn't always work back in the 1980s either. <laughs> so it was not completely uncommon to get various functions of the radar not working. Well, we were in low level air defence so the pulse Doppler radar was the, the main part of the radar you needed to work. It wasn't always working and so sometimes you'd have to rely upon your wingman who might take swap the lead and uh, thump the appropriate part of the box and reset circuit breakers in the cockpit to try to get them uh, working and sometimes they would come back up and sometimes not <laughs> <laughs> And I think uh, Mike, the idea is now to have a look at the, uh, to chat to some of the guys who have done the refurbishment and uh, have a word with them on what the, uh, the work that they've done. Yeah. Welcome um, to me, uh, David Waterfield. I'm the chairman of uh, the British Phantom Aviation Group. Uh, we were established three or four years ago um, to bring together all, um, ex Phantom engineers, pilots, ground crew. Uh, auxiliary trades who uh, worked on these aircraft in the Royal Air Force uh, and overseas over the years um, to bring together the experience um, and knowledge that these aircraft brought into service. So um, BPAG were asked uh, two years ago um, with discussions with the owner of 490 Mike Davy whether we'd be interested in helping with restoration uh, and uh, last summer we agreed to start with Newark giving us permission to start here so Paul Wright who's around somewhere and myself uh, we're given permission to, to work here and we've been doing uh, two or three days uh, a week sometimes over the last 12 months to bring 490 to this condition. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 you have to cut that bit out. Yeah. So um, we, we've been uh, down uh, once, once or twice a week, full days, doing corrosion repairs, um, 
canopy works, surface finish, localised uh, airframe repairs as well to a battle damage repair standard to bring it to the state where we are today. Um, ongoing from that, uh, we'll be doing further works to lettering, further details to systems, hopefully getting pneumatics working on the canopies, maybe some small power for the cockpit instruments. And then from next month, we're moving on to uh, moving XV582 from Lucas, which is Black Mike. We'll be coming down to Bruntingthorpe, so we have a, a full month in July uh, of strip down, ready for road transport, and then the rest of the time will be reassembly in due course at Bruntingthorpe. My name's Paul Wright, um, ex Air Force dual trade engineer, airframes and engines. Worked on this aeroplane when it was an aeroplane. Worked on Phantoms and Hawks and Tornadoes in the Air Force, and I've worked in civilian aviation and engineering ever since. Saw this on Facebook when it was looking a lot tattier than it is now, and said, well, if you want somebody to come and fix it up and make it look nice, I'll do that. Got involved with Dave. A lot of people said they'd come and help. The only people that turned up were me and Dave. And we spent the last, I suppose, seven or eight months, a couple of days a week, rain, shine, sunshine, whatever. Bringing it back to conditions here it is now. Uh, labour of love, really. Just did it for because it's a hobby. I'm retired. Something to do. Come here, Spud. <laughs> this is Thomas. He's my lad. He helped out, didn't you? Yeah. You did. And uh, yeah, I don't know, really. It's just just didn't want to see it go to rack and ruin. You know, it was Mike who owns it. Lives a long, long way away and nobody else was looking after it because it doesn't belong to the museum so I thought we'd pitch in and the more it went on the more we wanted it to look like it does now quite happy with it there's still a lot to do a lot of the detail work to do now how long did it take to get to this this far we started I suppose all in all we've been involved in it for about a year I guess um, sometimes you're here two days a week three days a week basically been here every day this week trying to get it up to speed and then other times with the weather, through the winter, we went weeks without working on it. I've no idea how many hours we put in. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah? So, enough. <laughs>which took a bit of getting used to because on the T4 and the V2 when you trained you actually made sure the good engine was fully forward. Did many roles in the, in the aircraft um, from flying at low level where we would do tactical targets, um, fly past army ranges taking pictures of tanks and things like that. Uh, we also um, uh, would fly uh, um, uh, against targets like um, power stations, radio masts, things like that, take pictures of them and then take them fly back film developed uh, and onto the, the table for the photographic interpreters. We also went uh, medium level and high level where we did survey and the navigator would lie down the nose and he'd keep us on the line over the ground um, of a, using what we called a banana site. It just looked like a banana and he'd tell the pilot tell me to turn left or right just keeping us on the lines and then the maps went the photos went away to be made into maps uh, we also did um, shipping where we'd go out find a ship and fly down one side fly over the top and fly down the other side um, i've done aircraft to crash reconnaissance so when there's been an aircraft crash uh, i've been out and taken the photographs for the board of inquiry we also did um, assist the civil uh, civil, civil, civilian community. We did, uh, like when there was flooding, we'd go and take pictures and uh, the um, police would, if they were going to do a raid somewhere, would invariably get us to come and take pictures to, uh, um, for them to have a look at the site before they raided it. Um, we've done other stuff like looking for drugs being made, so we'd fly with infrared cameras 
over uh, houses which they think suspected uh, drugs were being uh, made and just to, with the infrared camera checking the heat from the house, that kind of thing. Also done um, things against the IRA terrorists. Uh, uh, a while back they had a, a mortar bomb attack at London Heathrow and uh, I was sent down to fly up and down over Heathrow, uh, Stansted and Gatwick at 2,000 feet taking survey pictures um, to look around all around the airfield to see if there was any other mortars that they planted anywhere. It was good because all the civil airliners had to ha hold off whilst we went up and down. We went to see the world in these things. Uh, um, I flew out to, camp, uh, to Hong Kong um, by civil aircraft um, and another crew flew the aircraft out. Unfortunately in Sri Lanka at Colombo the pilot of the aircraft got his his, uh, his face covered in fuel by one of the uh, chaps refueling the aircraft and it got into his eyes and so I was called up from Hong Kong uh, to fly in a VC-10 down to Colombo to pick the aircraft up, fly it out back out to Hong Kong um, with his navigator and then uh, myself and my navigator flew the aircraft back from Hong Kong via Malaysia and uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Oman, Cyprus and then back home again. I also went on a trip out to Belize. Unfortunately the weather, there was a typhoon around in Belize and uh, um, we had to spend a few days in Bermuda before coming back home. Uh, that was a, a, hard, do a hard job. Um, the, um, we also did uh, Oman survey, uh, Denmark survey and uh, been to Germany doing survey work, the work there. Uh, so it's quite uh, variable tasks. I left the, the squadron disbanded in the uh, end of 1981, uh, where I went off to uh, uh, become an instructor to teaching people on the Jet Provost 5 at Cranwell. Um, from there, I went to back to Cam Canberra, where I was an instructor on the OCU, teaching people how to fly the Canberra. And uh, from there, after five years, uh, I then went on to 39 Squadron Stroke 1 PRU uh, to fly the Canberra PR9, again doing lots of photo reconnaissance tasks. And from that uh, I was sent to the simulator, Tornado Simulator at Cottesmore to work with Triple TE. When that disbanded they sent me up to Lossiemouth to help the Tornado Simulator up there. That, and that's where I retired from the Air Force two years early to work for Talus on the tornado simulator where I've been there uh, uh, since uh, 2004 teaching on that and I retired two years ago so done a lot I've flown lots of airplanes had a good time and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it <laughs>